Hello, everybody, and welcome to this first NC Bio webinar on the ethics of COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, here is what we have today. So first, uh, chair of the Nordic Committee on Bioethics, Sigurur Christensen, will open this meeting or seminar, uh, webinar series. After that, we have our keynote, Professor Matti Hauru. And then there are two commentaries, one from Professor Eja Margaret Brun Jarsdottir from University of Iceland, and another from a senior lecturer, a member of the NC Bio, uh, Madeleine Heijenjelm, University of Umeå. And after that, we have a question and answer part. And this time we arrange it in a way that please send in uh, uh, questions during the webinar uh, via this uh, YouTube uh, chat function. So we select some of the que questions to be answered in this general question part. Now, please, uh, Sigurur. Yes, thank you, Marco. Uh, on behalf of the Nordic Committee on Bioethics, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this first installment of our webinar series on the ethics of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, for the next few months, we will have monthly discussions on this topic that is overwhelmingly relevant uh, for all of us. Each event will feature a keynote speaker from one of the Nordic countries, as well as two commentators, followed by some general discussion. Uh, trying to share a slide here. There you go. Um, the Nordic Committee on Bioethics was founded in 1989 to promote uh, Nordic cooperation and exchange uh, of information between scientists, parliamentarians, opinion leaders, and public officials in the area of bioethics. Uh, the Secretariat for the Committee is provided by Nordforsk. The Committee is multidisciplinary, representing, for example, philosophy, medicine, nursing, sociology, biology, biotechnology, theology, and law. It has two members from each of the Nordic countries of Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden, as well as observing members from uh, the Faroe Islands and Åland. Among the regular tasks of the committee is the publication of an overview of legislation on biotechnology in the Nordic countries. This has been done annually uh, since 19, uh, 2016. Uh, the committee has issued various other publications uh, over the years related to events. The main work of the committee, however, consists in the organization of conferences on bioethical issues relevant to the Nordic countries. Normally, we arrange two or three conferences annually. So far, there are well over 50, covering a wide range of topics, as can be seen on our website, ncbio.org. This year, we had to uh, invent ways around the pandemic, as so many others. A conference on the use of DNA in police work had been scheduled uh, to be held in Oslo in April, but was transformed into a three-day webinar in September. Faced with all these re realities of the pandemic, the committee also decided to serve its mission by organizing this webinar series that is being launched here today. I would like to give special thanks to the working group for its great efforts in uh, preparing this under the firm leadership of the working group chair, Marco Atenzu, as well as the North Fosk uh, Secretariat. In addition to the current webinar series, we are organizing further events for 2021 on two timely topics, the ethics of artificial intelligence in healthcare and research and ethics and climate change. Uh, registration occurs through the NC Bio homepage. So please follow us there and sign up for the newsletter uh, at ncbio.org. Uh, and I encourage you all to look at this and, and perhaps sign up for, for these events. Now, our keynote sp speaker today is Professor Matti Hayri, Professor of Philosophy, at, and, uh, Philosophy of Management at the Aalto University School of Business in Finland. 
Professor Hayri uh, earned his doctorate in practical uh, philosophy at the University of Helsinki in 1991 and worked as lecturer and research fellow in Helsinki since 1985 until appointed professor of philosophy at the University of Kuopio in 1999. Then he moved to England, where he was first professor of moral philosophy and head of the Center for Professional Ethics at the University of Central Lancashire from 2001 to 2004, and then professor of bioethics and philosophy of law at the University of Manchester in 2004 to 2013, before moving back to Finland to take his current position. One of his areas of specialization is bioethics. He founded uh, the pioneering doctoral program in bioethics and medical jurisprudence at the University of Manchester in 2007 and has served in the International Association of Bioethics Board of Directors from 2001 to 2009, uh, uh, the last two years as the association's president. Now, Professor Hayri is an extremely pro prolific scholarly writer. His publication record includes at least 14 authored books, 21 edited works, and uh, at least 257 articles and book chapters in international and national journals and series. This year alone, he has produced no less than eight articles nationally and internationally on bioethical questions raised by the COVID-19 pandemic, in addition to numerous blogs on these topics. So I am extremely happy to welcome Professor Mati Heiri as our keynote speaker today. His talk poses the question, can crisis leadership be ethics communication? So thank you very much, Sigurdur. That was really, really nice introduction. So we now have participation from so many time zones Australia, United States, Europe, Switzerland. Hi, Krista. Uh, miss you too. And the Nordic countries and the Baltic countries that I cannot use any time of the day specific salutation. So I'll just say hi, everybody. It's wonderful that you are here. Now, my this thing isn't working. So and we cannot do it like this. So fix it, fix it, fix it, please. So this is, this is my question today. Can crisis leadership be ethics communication? And these are my five protagonists. They are the key cabinet ministers who during last spring were the face of the Finnish government in the, in the COVID uh, pandemic. Now I let them drift into oblivion in there and, and then I'll go straight into my choice on Friday the 13th of March this year. And as you will know, in seven and a half minutes, I started out from the top left corner. I jumped over the middle part at first. I gave some consideration to the top right corner to be on the right side of the law. I started liking the bottom uh, right corner checked here uh, quickly in the middle part and the left part and then I ended up in the middle uh, and in the middle there was the maximum rule that I liked the most. But don't take my word for it now, I'll build it for you from elements. Now COVID-19 pandemic had landed in Finland. The universities were considering the possibility of remote learning Aalto University had decided to make the switch during this week. It was Friday and I had a business ethics class scheduled for Monday. Now the question was, should the class be held or not? And this is what I call Matti's choice on Friday, the 13th of March, 2020. Now, luckily in the course, we had just familiarized ourselves with uh, the main theories of ethics. Act utilitarianism, which basically says that we should always, with our every act, try to produce as much happiness or well-being to the world. Rule utilitarianism, which says that you cannot calculate that act by act. Let's do it rule by rule and then follow the rules. Then moral legalism is not even an ethical theory, but it's how many people think about morality, at least in Finland, perhaps in other countries as well. It's just that uh, it's legal, so it's, it's moral as well. Then on the 
uh, bottom right corner we have Kantian ethics, uh, Immanuel Kant, German philosopher who emphasized humanity and protecting humanity at all times, never using it merely as a means, but always also as an end. Natural law theory, which says basically the same, but specifies that we should try to survive, uh, seek shelter, uh, reproduce, uh, educate our children and seek knowledge about the nature and about God. And then we have virtue ethics, which has many versions, care ethics, for instance, but uh, uh, the version I used in here was uh, Aristotelian golden mean. Don't do too much, don't do too, too little. So I started out from the act utilitarian corner to settle the fix facts of the situation. Now, the argument against act utilitarianism is that we don't know the consequences of our, of our actions from here to eternity, so we cannot make an act utilitarian decision at all. So, meaning that if I now drop this machine from my hand, then something happens in your head, in your head, and then you do something that you wouldn't have done, and then it might be a few moves from there and it's the end of the world or eternal bliss, whatever. You know the butterflies' wings and forest and, and uh, hurricanes and, and that sort of thing. I say that's rubbish. In this situation, I could, it was clearly foreseeable that the risk of contagion would have been reduced had we uh, not gone to the classroom. The learning outcome would have suffered unless we did a bit of extra work. So I left it at that at this moment. I jumped over rule utilitarianism first because I didn't know which rule I should use. So, but that turned out to be crucial. I then gave some consideration to moral legalism. Now, laws were ambiguous, they were quickly changing. Uh, neither solution was forbidden. Go to the classroom, it's not forbidden. Uh, don't go to the classroom, that's not forbidden. Laws were getting stricter, so it seemed safe to err on the side of caution. But caution regarding what? Contagion? learning outcome. Then I moved into the Kantian ethics corner and, and I saw that treating humanity as an end in myself and in others prioritizes health easily over both learning outcomes and the nuisance of extra work. But again, we need a rule, a univer as universal and as acceptable to all as possible. Then I checked in uh, the natural law theory and decided that when life and limb are in danger, most other basic values and goods yield, just as in the Kantian ethics. Now, the virtue ethics, a golden mean between what extremes? Well, perhaps if I had panicked and stopped the course, which I didn't do, that would have been too much, and uh, doing nothing and just letting the harm come uh, would have been too little. So the mean is doing the, the proper thing. And when I was thinking what the proper thing is, I then remembered the maximin rule and settled on it as rational. And it says, avoid the alternative that could result in the worst outcome. So it's a risk aversion strategy. Even if the best outcome in there might be better than in some other alternatives, if it can go really horribly wrong, then don't do it. And I settled on that. I decided we are not going to the classroom because the classroom uh, would be a dangerous place I made a rule utilitarian and a Kantian decision in there and there. Fantastic, I made my choice. Now, today our topic is crisis leadership as ethics communication. So we move forward from that. Now, immediately after I had made my decision, my, my crucial choice, I sent a message to all the students and I made this decision uh, diagram that you see uh, the next assignment. And the question was, did Matti do the right thing? Analyze and evaluate. And they did analyze and they did evaluate. And, and a view merging from there was that this was a nice piece of uh, work evasion from my part. Uh, students and teachers see uh, these situations a bit uh, differently. They saw that not coming to the uh, lecture hall uh, for an hour would have been a major convenience for me. Anyways, I made them the promise that 20 uh, started the course, 20 will complete. And then after reassignments, new questions, putting the lectures on, on the net and this and that. A mere six months later, uh, in, sept uh, in early September, I returned the last assignment to the last student and was able to announce to the class that I had made, uh, kept my promise, 20 started, 20 completed. 
So that's how, we, how that one went. But now some other people in Finland were also making choices at, at that time. The government was considering reactions to the spread of contagions in the COVID pandemic. Most of the infections were in Uusimaa province and those over 70 seemed to be at risk. They knew that something ought to be done, but what? And one of the options they had open for them was to isolate Uusimaa province from the rest of the country and isolate those over 70 from other people. So this is what was the Finnish government choice on Wednesday, the 25th of March, so a mere couple of weeks after my momentous choice. Now, on what grounds could they do their, make their choice? Of course, had they asked me, I would have told them that, that here's a model that you can use, not use this nice map. They didn't come to me, so, so they didn't use this. But I can still place them on the map because this sort of tells everything about morality and, and ethics uh, anyways. So in the, in the top left corner there, we have THL, that's the Finnish acronym for the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare. And they were in charge in the beginning, and they said that we should contain the pandemic. They said that health would be promoted, lives would be saved, and qualities would be maximized. Quality means quality adjusted life here. It's a boring uh, health economic tool, never, never mind that now. But they were saying that and the government was listening to them. So the government came out, uh, stood in, on a platform and said, this is what we must do, there is no alternative. Now, this was a nice, good, strong message and good ethics communication. Uh, there was an element of a national match in there. Finland and Sweden every year have these athletic competitions where they take measure of uh, each other and that used to be a really important thing and the spirit still, still lives in Sweden and, and in Finland. So now we had a national match because our health utilitarians said contain the pandemic, uh, the Swedish uh, health utilitarians said something else. So now we were in competition and we could compare our, our results. Of course, there was some caring as well. We are protecting our elderly, the over 70s. Now, to the other corner then, uh, the, the opposition arose, and that was the human rights lawyers who said that uh, this, this is legally dubious. We should save lives, and if anyone now, because now Uusima, they said that now they isolate Uusima province, Uusima province is isolated. If anyone who doesn't get to their summer cottage gets killed, in, in Helsinki or in Espo, that will be the government's fault and, and their heads will roll. And people have rights, so you cannot stop them on the border and so on and so forth. Well, they sort of quickly went away. They became the, the lone voice in the wilderness and, and they just faded in the background. Now, my maximum rule would have been possible, of course, and now there were other possibilities there like Republicanism, by which is, here I mean a political philosophy that we are all citizens. If we decide to choose leaders who then choose to restrict our freedom, then it's not really a restriction of freedom or a bad restriction of freedom because we have chosen that restriction of freedom, sort of. Some uh, philosopher in Finland said something about that. I said something about Maximin, and then we had a storm uh, in a teacup. In Finnish, the, the idiom goes, a storm in a water glass. So this is the symbolism here, and, and, and it's uh, transparent, so we can see still the principles in there. So uh, in, mean, in the meantime, in the real world, uh, thing, things started happening. The care of the elderly failed, and they were getting sick, and they were dying. People started making their own laws. The headline there says, that the government owes uh, the elderly an explanation. The government had recommended that they stay at home. They thought that they were law uh, ob obliged to stay at home and they, they never saw their grandchildren and they started complaining. Well, that was their own, own law, not the government's. Other people were start trying to say obviously that there are other values besides health and constitutional lawyers now joined the human rights lawyers saying that the law was the law, the emergency law that uh, allowed the closure of Uusima province was a bit hasty and a bit strict and so on and so forth. So, so now 
the government had to withdraw that strong message, the national match was for that part over, and that now they were facing another choice. And now we are uh, already in June uh, this year. And now they are thinking what else they could do. Now remember our task here today, our question. Can crisis leadership be ethics communication? Yes, absolutely it can. Health utilitarianism, the, the top left corner worked like a charm for anyone. But what about after? How about after health utilitarianism? And I've chosen a picture where they are out of focus because they went out of focus in June, they are still out of focus, and, and that just symbolizes the situation. Now, let me get this straight. They are not out of focus when it comes to facts. Now, they are giving us the check the, the fact box. They, they are giving, giving us all the facts. The government is, is allowing uh, over 500 meetings. It's uh, forbidding over 500 meetings. The 70 years should uh, stay at home. They should uh, come out of their houses. Sports events are forbidden. For, uh, sports events are allowed. We are getting that information. But what we are not getting is why. Why are we doing all this? Why this sport event? Why that sport event? And so on and so forth. And this is, uh, takes us back to our question, crisis leadership as ethics communication. Now, I said before that the government can use me as the role model and they could use me again. So I messaged the students and made the decision diagram known to them and so on and so forth. What has the government done? Or what did they do? In there. Well, they did inform citizens as soon as they, they made decisions. So, okay, check that box. Uh, the ethical basis of decisions has not been revealed, so we are back to the old normal in there. Now, citizens' participation in decision making has not been in any way encouraged, so they, they didn't uh, do what I did. And they have not been looking for mistakes, so we cannot learn from the mistakes. And still, we need to do something. These are from June, and uh, Christian Lagarde said that the worst of the corona crisis is over. It isn't. Uh, Germany was expecting the second wave. Well, now we have the second wave, and it was obvious that we'll have the second wave. And I cannot understand what people did during the summer. Uh, yet another other airline or, or big company gets billions uh, in, in uh, subsidies in the top left corner, a couple of world leaders who had one approach uh, towards the pandemic in the top right corner, a couple of other world leaders who had another approach to this. So something needs to be done here. So let's take this once again, one by one now. So the first principle here is openness. You must inform your subject of the decisions you make at once. So continue to communicate decisions to people. Then transparency. Reveal the ethical basis of decisions. Try to work out and tell what is aimed at and why. Then participation. Learn what people want and adjust to that. So voting in elections is, is not enough. Better mechanisms are needed in here. And then criticality. We need to learn lessons for future governments too, but this is against the politician's nature because the politician looks at the next election, so other actors are required. So perhaps the other actor could be something like the Nordic Committee on Bioethics. I don't know. Let's take a closer look, however, on the top right corner and what is try to work out and tell what is aimed at and, and why. And let's start with the what is aimed at question. The first thing that was aimed at, at uh, in the spring was confinement, just confine the pandemic. We have now moved to test, track, treat and isolate. That's not self-evident. There was an alternative that was discussed in April and, and May, and that was suppression. Just eliminate the disease from your country. You cannot eliminate it globally, but from your country. And Iceland, I understand, has tried to do this in the spring and and succeeded, but started immediately thinking about when are we going to open up the economy and what happens next. Anyway, the test, track, treat, and isolate and suppression policies combined, they make the dance that somebody uh, named. And the dance is basically this. So, lift the restrictions, see how it goes, 
put it back in place if it fails. Lift the restriction and so on and so forth. You can do it in, in Rumba steps. Anyway, so that was what was uh, done. What was, uh, but why was it aimed at? Well, confinement was aimed at to keep the health service functioning, obviously, until the acute threat is overdue to, for instance, vaccinations, which would then be the suppression thing. The test, track, treat and isolate is open up the economy and without violating law or morality by the dance in there. So let's go back to our map one more time. So what's going on in, in here? The values that we, we know that we have are that we have health utilitarian values in the le top left corner and we have some legal values, at least in Finland, in the bottom right corner. We have economic values somewhere in there, but they are close to the utilitarian health values. We have care, culture, mental health values, which are close to virtue ethics. We have compassion values, which are sort of uh, the, the care uh, version of virtue ethics. And we have a sense of law, which sort of belongs in the moral legalism corner. We have the, the citizen's uh, viewpoint, which can be over there, but it can also be over there. And then we have my maximin. So my question to the Finnish government and to any government is, where are we on this map? I mean, we used to be in the health values corner and we were obedient lambs and we, we did what was told uh, and, and that was fine. And we all felt safe. Now we don't feel safe because we don't know where we are. And I'm leaving this question to be settled now by, by the, the top five today. One of the ministers has been replaced. Uh, he's the minister of finance and his relative size here uh, might be just symbolic for times to come. The finances might be more important in the future, but we don't know. Time will tell. And I will finish by giving you what my team has done so far. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Matti, for the presentation, and I apologize for the minor technical problems there. Uh, we move now to the commentaries part, and uh, first we have uh, the com commentary from Professor Eja Brunjarsdotter. Please. Uh, hello, um, and thank you, Matti, for a very interesting talk. Um, now, I think uh, Matti has brought up several important questions regarding how those in authority are to make decisions in a crisis, among other things, by throwing light on how various ethical theories can at the same time be helpful and less than helpful in such decision making. In other words, while some guidelines certainly can be derived from utilitarianism, Kantian ethics, uh, virtue ethics, and so on, no theory can provide us with an indisputable solution. And uh, even Matti's uh, final result when he was making his decision about uh, canceling class uh, through relying on the maximum principle relies on weighing several different values and interests against one another or trying to figure out which outcome would be the worst, which uh, we don't really know. Um, so we all end up having uh, trouble deciding on all sorts of things, whether we're teachers deciding whether to cancel a class and if so, what to do instead or uh, national leaders deciding what actions to take in order to prevent the spread of the virus. And, but I'm going to focus on the aspect of uh, Mati's talk that concerns information about those decisions and what lies behind them and some challenges associated with transparency in a crisis, uh, in crisis communication. And uh, I'm going to start from uh, a point that Mati uh, briefly mentioned about the policy in Iceland this spring, that is after the first wave of COVID-19 in Iceland that started at the very end of February, the number of new infections was brought down to zero for a couple of weeks in early May. 
And this was interpreted by some as it being the policy of Icelandic authorities to suppress the virus completely within the country. Uh, however, the chief epidemiologist, for instance, always stressed that we could reasonably expect some new infections uh, to keep uh, showing up every now and then. And uh, the main method for containment uh, seemed to be testing, tracking, isolating and treating. Uh, there was never a complete lockdown. Schools for children under 16 remained uh, open throughout, as did various businesses, and there were no restrictions on the general public's uh, freedom of movement. Uh, so the fact that the number went down to zero for a short while seems to have been more of a side effect of the circumstances a lucky side effect maybe, than um, a result that authorities had specifically aimed for. However, it became complicated to communicate to the public what exactly the goal was. And people seemed to make different assumptions about it and had different expectations. Uh, so some people took it to be the case that the aim was to suppress the virus completely within the country and keep the borders closed so that we could move around freely around the island without worrying about the virus. Others found it important to be able to admit tourists from abroad in order to keep tourism alive uh, for economic reasons. And, and uh, while the border was never completely closed, uh, there was this rule about a 14-day quarantine uh, required for everyone entering from the middle of March until June 15th, when this rule was replaced with testing everyone at the border entering from a country that was uh, considered high risk. And this change became a matter of contention throughout the summer, as some thought it should be a priority to keep the country completely virus free. Uh, and that was not consistent with this new policy, but others thought that the ability to move in and out of the country should be prioritized either for economic reasons, uh, tourism, or to ensure the freedom of individuals. And ever since the policies put in place have been under considerable dispute with some members of the public complaining about imposed restrictions being too harsh, while others consider them too lenient. And, uh, and now I wanna to get to, uh, uh, to Mati's list for crisis leadership as ethics communication, openness, transparency, participation and criticality. Uh, but I'm going to focus on transparency because uh, I believe that as important as it is, it's bound to result in discontent given a difficult crisis situation. And given the complex situation of the pandemic we're dealing with, it's to be expected that anything conveyed through transparency will be contested. Uh, if authorities reveal that it's not a priority to suppress the virus completely, they will be accused by some of disrespect for people's lives and even of willingly sacrificing the lives of those especially vulnerable to the disease. Uh, if concerns about the economy are expressed, claims will be made about money being prioritized over people. Uh, if restrictions are imposed that involve closing businesses or schools, Authorities will be accused of disregard for unemployment, impact on education, or the situation of disadvantaged students, and, and the list goes on, of course. Uh, and none of this is due to lack of transparency, but because the situation is impossibly complex with so many competing values and interests at stake. Um, so transparency about goals and the values and reasoning behind them and will, in this case, always involve referring to the preservation of some highly important value, but due to the difficult situation, it will also involve compromising or risking something that is also highly important. Uh, and due to the situation being unprecedented in our times, uh, the lack of information, about the nature of the disease or its possible effects or about how the virus spreads uh, or, and the impossibility of knowing when we will have a vaccine or, or some other type of cure or how effective that vaccine or cure might turn out to be. 
and the complexity of the possible effects of various measures taken. Absolutely nobody can be in the situation of knowing what is the best way to go, which uh, I think Mati also uh, suggested there is no way of knowing the best way. Maybe we can try to look for, well, look to avoid the, the worst possible result. Um, but uh, the most that any well-meaning authorities can honestly say, if they're being honest, uh, and even if they're trying uh, their very best, uh, all they can say is, well, we have looked at all the currently available information and after careful consideration, we have decided to try this particular approach, which we hope is the best one available, even th though we can't be certain. And yes, that approach will result in sacrificing some of A and B in order to save as much as, as we can of C. Uh, in other words, fully transparent communication by authorities is bound to include uh, things that people just don't like to hear. And there is no way to avoid that. Not because of bad decision-making skills, but because they're is absolutely no way out of the situation that doesn't involve the loss of something we value very highly. Uh, to, uh, and uh, well, I'm just going to briefly summarize uh, what I think is my main point. Transparency is bound to result in disputes precisely because there are so many competing values and interests at stake. And no matter where we turn, a number of people will be unhappy with not only the decisions, but also with the reasoning behind them. And uh, uh, yes, I'm going to end here. Thank you very much for your, your comments, Aya. And now we move to the se second commentary by senior lecturer Madeleine Heyen, -Yelm. please. Unmute, share screen. Um, uh, yeah. so, so do you, yes, am I screen sharing? <laughs> uh, not yet, okay. Um, okay, sorry. Um, so share screen. Okay, now I, I'm, <laughs> I think I'm on screen. So I will begin with the very question that Harry has uh, proposed that we ask ourselves, can crisis leadership be a form of ethics communication? And as we have seen, uh, the answer to this is a broad uh, yes, in some sense, uh, that's the proposal we get. So what I want to do here is first complicate the picture a bit uh, in one particular respect and to suggest that we lift our gaze a little bit and ask the bigger, harder ethical questions. And then I'm going to pose a question or two directly to uh, Mati. So that's what I want to do. So uh, Harry's proposal, as I understand it, puts two very specific things in view in terms of pandemic leadership. First, a decision of a policy in terms of dealing with a pandemic, and second, a communication uh, of the ethical justification for such a decision of policy. Um, and to f give that some more detail, he lists four different policies. We've all sort of seen these names um, in various places, I think. There's the contain and mitigate as one policy. There is a buildup of, of herd immunity as one policy. There's a, a test, track, isolate and treat as a third policy option. And then there is a suppression. 
um, options. So, so the, the idea is that these these are the, on the, the smorgasbord of policies that we should make our, our mind up uh, if we are in the position of a government making a decision on what to do. And then the second part comes with a recommendation of communicating this in an open and ethical manner with uh, the stress on, on openness about which decision of policy that's been made, uh, the stress on transparency and the ethical justification for that choice, the invitation of including lay views and, and the general public to participate in that decision, and then a critical part of evaluating and uh, learning from the various choices we make. So uh, with that in mind, I got a bit stuck on these four policies because um, they're hopelessly vague in one sense. Um, they don't seem to be very specific in terms of a particular mean. Uh, if we go, uh, the, the contain and mitigate seems to include everything from the Paris curfew to recommendations of hand washing, uh, to various kinds of social uh, me measures. And uh, even though Sweden is presented as an outlier with a more liberal point of view, it would certainly fit the bill of the, the first policy, uh, as would the Paris curfew where you're not allowed without a permit to leave that your own house uh, with police enforcement after 10 o'clock. So it's unclear to me whether this is a list of distinct aims or which it doesn't seem to be either. Herd immunity might be some kind of aim that could be, but that doesn't really specify any specific measures because that could be reached with vaccine. Um, the suppression one seems to be about either locking the virus out from your own borders or locking, keeping it put in a particular place and locking it in, which seems to, uh, um, might be some kind of measure, but they, they seem, from a philosophical point of view, liking neat categories, they don't seem to be a neat list of distinct aims nor a list of distinct measures, but instead some of them seems to, to contain a whole very mixed bag of very different measures that could be implemented in very different ways and come with their own risks. And possibly some could be implemented in a very strict sense or in a very lenient sense and the extent of how that could be done and to the extent you could be successful or whether you could actually choose something in the first place seems to depend a lot of already made decisions. Uh, I think one of the cases that became very clear in the Swedish case was that uh, the testing and tracing option wasn't really there because it's been down prioritized to have the actual chemical stuff to conduct the tests on a large scale at the very early stage. Um, or there was a lack of protective gear. So that wasn't, so, so that limits the choices. So it seems like um, A, that these policy questions, even if they're very openly communicated, it wasn't very clear to me what is actually communicated on that level. Um, so maybe it's more informative in one sense to go more narrow and be more specific about what measures and why. And then on the other hand, in terms of the ethical parts to actually become more broader and ask the big ethical questions and where we want to, to land in a, uh, in a longer perspective, where do we want to what kind of society do we want to open up to after the end of the pandemic and how what kind of society do we want to be while we're implementing these measures and what kind of moral beings would we like to be in the case of the um, un under a pandemic so those were the questions that i was um, uh, stuck with so i suggest that perhaps instead of looking at particularly moral rationales for particular policies or looking at the list of normative theories, maybe we could just ask, lift the, the level <laughs> a little bit and ask what kind of question would a proposal uh, such as um, ethical communication as a part of uh, pandemic leadership, what kind of question would that answer? And maybe uh, it would answer something like this. 
what is the morally right thing to do in the face of a pandemic? And what would the best policy be? And if that's the question, then there might be uh, other ways to, to think about it. Um, and so I just like to stress these two parts that I uh, was thinking about. First is how bounded the, this question is, how much it's restricted by previous political decisions and what resources are available in the first place. It seems like the freedom to choose from policies is very restricted, um, which of course means that we could now give some thought on what kind of policy options and measures we won't like to be able to choose from in the future, but the, uh, but the current decisions might be restricted in, in uh, very many ways. And that needs to be communicated as well. And then the ethical questions uh, could be raised, I think, instead of looking at each specific moral theory, we could ask the kind of questions that, that they point to and, and that underline each of these theories about values, about the long-term ideals we would want to see our society move, um, realize in some sense and whether there are certain means that are simply off limit because they, they're uh, principal arguments against certain of them. Um, so that would suggest something like asking the questions about what values must an ethical response and policy promote and what negative values that we must uh, combat. Perhaps that would be something like at all cost avoiding death toll and, and a pandemic out of control and whether there are ne certain means that would never be acceptable, perhaps uh, an, an undignified death uh, or might be such a thing. Um, what kind of society would we want and what kind of persons would we like to be? And perhaps then that would be something like a democratic society where vulnerable people are cared for. But maybe that level would be easier to communicate. Um, that's a suggestion. Um, so now to two more specific questions for uh, Mati. Uh, the first one has to do about the choice of policy and, what, and to what degree that communicates something um, very specific. What can a choice of policy communicate if the differences lies in particular measures rather than at the level of policy? Uh, and if the decision itself is largely bounded by previous decision and what is possible to actually decide at various times. Perhaps uh, what needs to be communicated in leadership as ethics communication might be something else, such as an overall strategy based on short-term values as well as long-term ideals. That's the first question. The second one is in the moral in, in a moral situation of very non-ideal circumstances, such as a pandemic, what can we actually to what extent can actually the Maximine principle uh, give us any action guiding advice in the first place? It seems to me that the very worst case scenario is not very helpful because that would be having absolute doing nothing and having the pandemic roam at large without any kinds of mitigations or preparations. And if that's the case, then it seems like the Maximine could actually justify any measure um, which wouldn't be very helpful. Uh, but on the other hand, this seems like all different kinds of measures have at the far end kind of risks. So tracking could be very effective by smart technology, but that might slip into surveillance concerns um, going and, and so on. So there, there might so there might be very bad indeed scenarios at the far end of very many uh, policy decisions and, and measures. So in that case, um, what we need to look at, it might be the, the conflicting um, uh, values and the far ends and very many bad indeed cases rather than a single worst case. Um, yes. And so I'd uh, leave that to Mati to read. Thank you so much, yeah. Madeleine, for your commentary. And uh, 
now we have some uh, possibility for Matti to respond to these commentaries. Right. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Eya and Madeleine. Uh, I will try to answer your questions in, in, in the order that you, you, you uh, presented them. First of all, Eya was saying uh, that uh, Maximin has uh, different dimensions, and of course it has different dimensions. I don't even, and this is the end of my, my answer to Madeleine's second question as well, I don't even know if, if Maximin is is the, the right answer in here. It's just one of the, it's just the, the answer that I happened to stumble to when I was making my decision. Which brings me to, to, to a, a side point uh, which we might be interested in here. I'm talking about decision making and making moral choices. Did I make a choice? I mean, uh, I, later on I, I realized that I, the choice was made for me at some point, I mean, I knew that I was never going to go to that classroom. I was trying to rationalize it to myself and being a moral philosopher and knowing all these ethical theories, I just put it in, in that uh, deceptive cloak, perhaps. I don't know. So do we ever make any, any decisions at all? Uh, and the, the next thing in, in Aya's uh, um, commentary was started by the, the isolation and the tourism and, and some people wanted to keep the disease out of the island and some people wanted to have the economy rolling and, and of course that's true. And then uh, I heard you uh, proceeding to the point that we might not be able to tell the truth to the citizens because some of them uh, think that this is valuable, some of them think that that is valuable, somebody, somebody will win, somebody will lose, somebody will always be, be unhappy. And, and this is a question that I was thinking about in the spring as well. And, and somebody said, Matti, you're an idiot, they cannot tell the truth. What if they come out and say, well, we are now protecting multinational businesses, international corporations, uh, at the cost of a few old people in, in the care home. Uh, you, you probably can't say that, but then that pr becomes a problem. My next move was to say, but you people are talking about liberal democracy. I don't know what that means, but you seem to know what that means. And in liberal democracy, we're supposed to have transparency and openness and truth. I mean, if you cannot have those and if you cannot tell the people that you are actually going for the big companies instead of your own people, then you shouldn't be in power, presumably. I don't know. Uh, then I, I think that that was uh, all that I had to say to, to, to A.S. Uh, wonderful commentary. Then Madeline, a complicated uh, lift gaze and, and what was the, the next one? I'm too vain to, to use my glasses, so pose a question. Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, first of all, thanks for saying the contain and mitigate, it just didn't fit into my, my nice uh, circle in there. Uh, the, there's a reason why I didn't mention uh, herd immunity, and it is that, as you said, Madeleine, uh, contain and mitigate is a really wide concept, and it contains the Finnish approach, and it uh, contains the Swedish approach, and this, uh, uh, Anders Tegnell never said that, that he was going for herd immunity. Well, he did a couple of times, but then he withdrew from that statement. So yes, uh, many things uh, can happen under these, these concepts. What I mean is that I'd like the government to tell me that whatever say to me, what, that whatever we are doing, be that contain and mitigate, be that test and track or whatever. Whatever we are doing, what you see us doing and what we are telling you that you should do, we are doing for, and then comes the big word, health, humanity, care, uh, a consideration of many things, because there are many things, if, if that's necessary, that complicates matters, but at least it's then honest and so on and so forth. And of course, then there are many justifications. I mean, uh, there could be a policy of letting COVID-19 pandemic kill as many human beings as possible to rescue the environment from humanity. A fine goal by me, but I don't think that people are going to, to buy that. Now, 
Madeleine, you asked about how the, uh, the current decisions are created by previous uh, decisions. And of course they are created by previous decisions. And uh, meat eating created COVID-19. So uh, I, I was all spring and I still am trying to connect this I can't say small crisis, but but relatively small small crisis, and connect that with climate change, uh, people still eating uh, non-human animal meat, and and so on and so forth. We have many sorts of crises going on in this world all the time, and I'm just trying to look at this one smaller crisis, uh, which I can sort of handle and conceptualize to see if I can find in that something that could then be moved to say climate change and all that. And uh, Madeleine, the, um, what, I'm, what my question tries to find out about uh, our decision makers is that how you place yourself on my map will tell me what your attitude towards the previous decisions is. And that tells me what you are going to do in the future and, and how you are going to, if, whether you are going to uh, keep repeating the same mistakes that we've done before and so on and so forth. So I'm trying to find a, a lever to, to use this crisis uh, to, to facilitate us to alleviate the next one. My problem in that one is that it all hangs on health utilitarianism. So uh, one value uh, consequentialist theory, that's the only one that, that ever worked for under Tegnell in Sweden or, or the Finnish authorities. And we cannot expect that to, to work for a very long time because people are going to tell us that there are other values. And that might just be the fate of the climate thing is an, and all those. And I'm ending up uh, by answering Madeleine's second question by saying that yes, Maximin has many dimensions and it's not necessarily the right answer anyway. So thank you very much for your commentaries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matti, for your response to the commentaries. Now we move to the, the question answer phase. And we have uh, received some questions, thank you so much, and some comments. Uh, we had to select just uh, some of them. I will have one comment first and question, and then uh, Matti can comment, answer, and then there is another still coming. So first one from Pekka Louhiala. It seems to me that the hidden aim so that one hidden aim of the activities has been to avoid the moral catastrophe that the intensive care units uh, would be full and the really hard choices at the individual level were to be made. That was a comment from Pekka Louhiala. Then there is a question from Mark Kutter. Would your decision-making matrix have been different or, or, or had different outcome rational if either you or your students had been in a vulnerable group. I'm wondering about its utility for evaluating p policy decision making in relation to disabled people and other vulnerable groups. So now we have, uh, if Matti wants to comment briefly this once, and then we have one more question. Yes, Pekka, uh, yes, absolutely, it was to avoid that moral crisis, but uh, there are many things going on in here, and that, that was the, the initial health utilitarian thing that the Finnish Institute for, for Health and Welfare tried to, to push through and, and managed to push through. It's just that, that in time it seems that people seem to lose the sense of the moral uh, disaster of, of the, the intensive care unit being, being overcrowded and, and many, many people dying. I mean, people just get numb and then they want to take their holiday. I mean, I'm, I'm giving you as an example, I know that not, many peop not too many people in Finland died during the summer, none of, of COVID-19. 
uh, and, and people wanted to have their holidays. But still, when I was looking at the situation, I, I knew in May, I knew in June that we'll, we'll have this second wave. Everybody knew that we'll have this second wave. And we knew that it some, it's brewing somewhere in there. And the lackadaisical uh, attitude that people had towards uh, going to their summer holidays, it made me sick. Anyways, uh, so people forget about the, those moral disasters. That was Pekka. Then Mark, uh, would it have made a difference to my decision, to my choice, if there had been vulnerable people in the classroom? Mark, I honestly cannot tell you because I made the decision thinking that there, there might be vulnerable people uh, in, in that group. So uh, in, in my maximum decision making, it was already inbuilt. What if this student or that student or that student is, is especially vulnerable? So I didn't need to see any signs. None of them was over 70. Uh, but I didn't know if they had a pre-existing disease, one of them, uh, more of them, or so on and so forth. So it was part of my decision, if I made a decision and not just rationalized my whatever happening. Thank you. Then we have a question from Joona Rasanen. Matti, should wearing ma face masks be mandatory now or if things get worse? Or can we trust that people make the right choices freely? Uh, Joona, I'm not a big fan of the face masks. It's, uh, it's something in, in the Finnish, Finnish DNA or Finnish cultural heritage that you, you think that they are for robbers. And, and, and awful, awful people. So, so that might, if, if I'm feeling like that, knowing that it uh, protects others, then how would other people think? I, I'm not sure that they, they should be... I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I mean, let's, let's make things... Let's talk these things now. In the spring, the Finnish government didn't even recommend uh, face mask use because the face mask train from China was stuck in Siberia and we didn't have enough face masks. So that's Pekka's uh, disaster in the, in the hospital ward situation in there. That face masks wouldn't be plentiful enough for, for the hospital. So that's why they didn't uh, recommend it then. The wording was really bad because they started by saying it doesn't protect you. I, I'm pretty sure that everywhere else in the world it, uh, people have been told that it protects themselves and they are using it to protect themselves because the justification it protects someone else that's just too complicated if, if I have to wear something something that I don't want to wear. So, so I'm thinking that they did make that mistake and it's uh, the Institute of, of Health and and welfare, so the ministry's mistake rather than the politicians of talking about uh, not protecting yourself at that stage. It's very difficult to turn the train now and say it's simple really. Uh, my mask protects you, your mask protects uh, me. It should be and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the reason for, for not making them, uh, the explanation for them not making them uh, obligatory now is economic again, because if they make them obligatory, then they have to provide them to, to all. They are not willing to do that, and, uh, and that's why it doesn't happen. Should it happen? Uh, I don't know. It's, it's really difficult to say, say such things about... Well, if people are in... I have to make a decision here. Yes, I've seen pictures of people in sports events and in theaters, and they are too close to one another and they are not wearing masks. Yes, let's make it. Yes, it, it, let's make it legally obligatory. Joana, thank you for prompting the, the choice out of me. Uh, thank you, Matti, for this. And uh, now it's uh, the end of this webinar. And I want to thank uh, our keynote, Matti, our commentaries, and our chair, and all the participants. And uh, I, I want to announce our next uh, 
webinar, which will be on uh, Tuesday, 24th November. And then uh, there will be keynote, uh, Professor Emeritus Jöran Kolste at that time, and again, two commentators. And you can see more information on our uh, website. Thank you so much. I close this webinar now. Thank you. Goodbye.